I want to say good afternoon to Mario. How's it going, bro? Good afternoon, bro. I'm good. You? I'm all right, man. This ain't really your thing, is it? The interviews, is it? Second, second one ever. So um, we haven't had time, you know. Um, I've always wanted to do one, but it's just fi trying to find the time. And whereas now we kind of step back ever so slightly, then I thought it would be a good time to, um, to come and see you. No, bro, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, man, just having some good bands behind the scenes. Um, like, bro, like, just, let's, let's just start. So, I know of the brands. So I'm gonna, actually, let me start how I came in contact with Fireway. Um, I live in South London, mm -hmm. and my sister was like, there's this place in the end, so to speak. Yeah, I'm not saying where. And she was like, look, the pizza are really nice. Because she loves pizza, so she likes prezzos and all those ones there. Then she said, look, look for Dad's birthday, we're gonna go to Fireway. I was like, for real? She's like, because I've never been it. I'd, bro, I never noticed it where it is, isn't it? Because you can, you can kind of walk past it and not yeah. notice it. Went in there, loved it, like, loved it. And like I said to you privately, the milkshakes, it did my calorie. Did you get me? It messed up my calorie count because it's, it's, it's really nice, bro. And like, that was the first time I came in contact with the brand. But I didn't know that it had, it's, it's almost been like since 2016 yeah. to now, like, as just on an overall perspective, are you like the newest? I would say we're definitely the, we're definitely the, the fastest um, growing. Obviously, I'm too busy to, to even look into too much what other companies are, you know, starting up. But obviously, there's always going to be um, other companies, other competition. But yeah, I would say we must be the fastest growing one. From what from what I've seen with the press releases and online, we're op we've opened ninety six shops since obviously that one in um, in Fort Neath. So so yeah, pretty much nearly a hundred stores in in five years. Was Fort Neath the first one? Or? Nah, um, Sutton, Sutton. Rose Hill, Sutton. So Fort Neath was the third one. The second one was Streatham. Um, so yeah, they were the first three. And then, if I remember correctly, nothing opened for the, the year after that. So there was still only three. And then in the third year, it just, just went crazy. All right, so that's cool. So we're going to scale back. So you're from South London. So tell me a bit about your background, though. Like, you know. I grew up in uh, Mitcham in South London. Um, two younger brothers, two younger sisters. So there were seven of us in a, um, a three-bedroom terrace house. So it was squashed. Um, you know, it could have been it could have been a lot better, but it could have been a lot worse. Um, went to school in Mitcham, then went to a secondary school, a bit out of the ends, you'd say. Um, all my friends went to the local school, so I was in a, a different environment. Um, I didn't know anybody, and I think from from an early age, well, from that age, about twelve, thirteen, uh, I kind of knew in the back of my head that, you know, I didn't really click school-wise. So I didn't really, I hated school, to be, to be totally honest. I hated school, um, used to miss school at least twice a week. Um, and the only thing that really kept me in school was when I started making money, selling sweets in the playground, which I, I can see from your podcast, quite a few people um, have mentioned. So selling, school, selling sweets in school, um, in the playground, um, that was kind of the education years. Um, and then left school at 16, didn't go to uni, tried to go to college, dropped out of a few college courses just because I didn't really enjoy what I was doing. And I think if you're, if you're being kind of forced from your, your, your parents or from you know, society into education and, and, you don't really, and you don't really enjoy it, then, then, you're, then your mind won't, won't be there. So apart from selling sweets in school and making a bit of money, like that, uh, I didn't really, um, I weren't a fan of school, should we say. And then left school at 16 and spent the next five years really just doing nothing much, just getting into, into trouble, messing around, um, no, sort of, no sort of aim, no sort of goals, no sort of anything really, just letting time pass, pass me by, which I think at the time, a lot of people in my group of friends were in the kind of same boat. So it didn't really feel like I was doing anything out of the ordinary. Um, and yeah, got, got into trouble, 
didn't really want to work for anybody else. Um, and then it just went on like that from the age of 16 to probably 21. Um, and then after getting into a bit of too much trouble, um, I got a job in Nando's, which was my first job, um, flipping chicken. I wasn't a fan of that. Um, got fired after about four, four or five months. Um, but I saved up a little bit of money from there. And then on the way back from work, one day I saw a, a shop to let. It wasn't even a shop, it was like a it was like a box. It was like half a shop. The shop had been split into like different sections. So it was half a shop. And I think the rent was something stupid, like hundred pound a week, it was nothing. But it weren't a shop, it was like a it was like a box. So I ended up renting that out and started selling coffee sandwiches in the morning um, and after about were you making sandwiches yourself or were you i was trying i wasn't i wasn't selling many to be honest it, it kind of it was my own business but it wasn't really it wasn't really making any money but i was working for myself you know so that was the big difference between working in nando's and getting paid a salary or working in doing something for yourself and even though you're not making money you're still you know on your own rules on your own on your own terms so that carried on for about four or five months and then i think too many friends and people were just hanging around outside it didn't really we weren't make we weren't making any money to be honest it was it was in a nutshell it, it was a failure it failed miserably but in a way it was good because it it taught me you know to fail and um, people even remind me today Said, oh, I remember when you had that shop in in Tooting. And I said, oh, no, don't don't talk about that because <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it it wasn't in my mind. It wasn't the best. Um, it wasn't the best best business idea I've had. But same time, you know, it it taught me the the ground foundations um, of having a business. So so yeah, that was the first first proper business that I had. That so when you that first business, bro, mm. like. What were the challenges you actually faced initially? You know what it is? When you, I think a lot of people have the idea that to start a business, you just need a product and that's it. But there's so many other things that you, you don't realize, like so many things from designing to accountants, to legal side of things, to packaging, to staff, to tax, there's so many, so many, and if once you, if you don't know and no one's told you, like no one told me, then everything hits you at once, and which is probably why a lot of businesses fail because they're not prepared. Um, they're not prepared, so them kind of things that I had no knowledge, no experience about, kind of knocked me off balance, if you will. So so yeah, that failed miserably. It was there every day for about five months, trying to sell coffee sandwiches but wasn't really selling anything the only probably positive out of that is that's where i met my my pop my, my girlfriend my partner so she was walking past every day probably felt sorry for me seeing me sitting in some box of a shop not selling any coffee not selling any anything so so she used to come in after work and and um yeah after five months you could say i gave up but i think it's important to know when to give up because you can always say, I'm not going to give up, I'm not going to give up. And you spend your whole life in this, in that case, in a, in a shop that's not really making any money. So, so I think you have to know when to, um, when to give up. Um, and then, yeah, closed that down and went back to doing nothing for, for a while. Um, and then after that, had a few online businesses, digital businesses. But I think with those kind of businesses, you can give up even easier because it's not an actual, it's not a physical thing. So it's it's a website. It's something that you can just turn off, you know, and say, oh, forget it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do it. So that was um, that was a few things that I did to pass pass the time. Um, so, so you met your missus when you had a shop, and then you closed the shop. Closed like, the shop. Like, and then you kind of like figure yourself out again. Yeah, it's it's not good to to obviously to fail, but like I said, sometimes you need to you need to fail. So that kind of knocked me back. Um, that kind of knocked me back, and then I went back to kind of just 
you know, messing around. Um, messing around and because there's not a lot of opportunities unless you've got money behind you you know if you've got money behind you you can say i'm going to do this i'm going to do that i'm going to do anything but if you don't have money the opportunities are very limited hence why i ended up you know renting a shop for 100 pound a week you know you can't go and say all right i'm gonna i'm gonna get a prime location on the high street you know if you haven't got any money you haven't got any references so i think it's it's it's, it's difficult okay so then that takes you up so that was still when I was about 21 and then I started, you know, just getting into trouble again, smoking, drinking and then I think it was at the age of, I think, 22. Um, yeah, cut a long story short, got into trouble and ended up having my house raided at six o'clock in the morning. Um, and even though I, I didn't, I knew in my head I didn't do anything, you know, wrong because it was a case of, you know, a mistaken situation. but when you're six o'clock in the morning and your younger brothers and sisters who you're supposed to be a role model being the oldest you know brother you're supposed to be a role model to them and your mum who it was my role model you know um and the struggle that she had bringing us up and then fast forward six o'clock in the morning there's 20 police in your house your mum's in handcuffs and although i could have Half of me was like happy that I knew I didn't do anything wrong, so nothing was going to come of it. But the other half of me thinking, you're not in education, you don't have a business, you're not working, what are you doing? You know, you can't really, you didn't have a really a leg to stand on because you could have, I could have said, look, I, I, didn't, I haven't done nothing wrong, so there you go. But at the same time, I haven't exactly done anything right, so I couldn't be, you know, over the moon. So, so that was that was probably a a turning point um, in, in, my, in my life, in my journey, that was a turning point where I said, no, you know what, i got to do something proper. So then I got another job in, um, it, was, um, it was a mental health charity fundraising on the street. The people that stop you and you know, annoy you, <laughs> ask for your bank details. So um, I'd done that for five months and it was good, but it was very commission based. You know, so if you didn't hit a certain target, they'll tell you to go home. So, so I did that for five or six months. The money was, was very good, thinking about it, thinking that it's a charity and they're paying you, you know, quite good money. Um, for me at the time, being 22 years old with no education, no, you know, A-levels or anything like that, um, to be paid a considerable amount of money, that was, that was quite good. I'd done that for five months. Then I was involved in a car crash, quite a big car crash um, in Tooting. I've got quite a bit of um, compensation money for that. So then I had some, I had some money, I had some pay slips. I went to the bank and took out a personal loan. Um, if you've got pay slips, you know, they'll give you not a massive amount of money. I think it was about 30, 35 grand. So that with the money that I saved, um, I thought, all right, I'm going to do like a proper shop, you know, like a, a proper shop, not on the high street, but a, a proper, a proper business, you know? So, I looked at franchising and um, I was going to do a subway. So I went through all the steps, all the stages. And at the last minute, I thought, you know what? The prices that they're charging, the commission, this, that and the other, it doesn't feel like it was my own business. It felt like I was a worker for someone else. So I pulled out of that at the last minute, but I'd already found a shop in Sutton. So I thought, you know, I need to go ahead with the shop unless I'm going to lose uh, a deposit and, and all the rest of it. So. I thought, what can I do? So I kept the kind of subway layout, but pizza. And being Italian, you know, pizza's quite close to home. So um, yeah, done pizza, created a logo, created, um, I don't even think I had a business plan to be honest. Created a logo, created a kind of branding design and, and yeah, done a subway style pizza and it just blew up from there. That's my, so you went on instinct a lot then, it seems like. Instinct slash, you know, risk. Um, and the response was good. The response was good, very good. It, it, went, it, it was busy. But the thing, one mistake that I made, um, which we changed, is the pricing point. The pricing point wasn't correct. And therefore, we was busy, but we weren't making any money. So people were saying, oh, your, your shop's doing well, you're, you're busy, like there's queues outside. But these times, you're not making any money. So at the end of the month, when you're paying all the expenses, like the staff, the wages, the council tax, 
the bills and then you haven't got no money left. Um, so we increase that by 20% and that is pretty much the profit margin, which is 20%. Um, and then, yeah, it just, it, just, it just grew from there. Do you know what? I think one of my friends had um, a shop in Central and they were telling me the, the council tech prices is it's crazy. And the worst thing, they don't even do nothing for you. I thought I used to think they'll collect the bins. They don't even collect the bins. You have to have a company that you pay like 400 pounds a month to collect the bins. So literally, they're paying you just for being in their area. They're taxing, they're taxing man just for for nothing. They're just, yeah. And some some places are, council taxes is the same as the rent. Like more towards central London. I know there's shops there. The rent is about three grand a month and the, the council tax is about two and a half grand a month. That's what I'm saying. I saw my, my guy something like he's worth like 30 a year. It's crazy. And it's just like, you wouldn't even, like, how's your business? Like, you've got to have such an amount of risk capital. Your yeah. thing has to work, because otherwise, how can it even make sense? Mm -hmm. you know? I think a lot of people think that it's going to be plain sailing and it's going to be easy having a business. Um, and then they, they realise it's not. And I think that's why there's a lot of, um, like I see on Instagram, people selling courses trading courses, property courses. There's all these courses that, they don't say it, but essentially they're just trying to sell get rich quick schemes. And you end up worse than when you started because you, can, you realize it's not that easy and you've spent 100 pound on, um, on a course. Um, not to say that you know, all of them don't work. My younger brother, he's on the crypto, the crypto thing and he's, he's making a decent amount of money. You know? But you have to be, you have to be on it. There's nothing, I don't think, no business that I know at least, that it's, it's gonna be so easy. Because if it was so easy, everybody would do it, you know? And, um, and I think that's where people become unstuck because you have to realize you have to put in what you get out and it's not gonna be easy. It can be the exact opposite, you know, stressful. What, recruiting, like how, how difficult can that be, getting the right people in the door? Luckily, thankfully, I've got a good team around me, you know, from marketing to operations to the distribution to the data. Luckily, I've got a very good team. But back in the day, when we started, I was pretty much doing everything myself. And that's what I thought being a businessman or being an entrepreneur was about. You have to do everything yourself. And I realized it's not. You have to be able to work with a variety of different people and bring them together in a, in a team and make the whole, you know, as they say, teamwork makes the dream work. You can't do everything yourself or you'll just burn out. I can remember it was a Friday night and um, I don't know, I was up since seven o'clock um, and it was a Friday night. It was busy in the shop. The chef called in sick. So we were understaffed in the shop. One of the drivers got stopped by the police, something to do with his insurance. So he was out of the picture. So I was doing deliveries and it was my friend's birthday. It was his 20... 23rd birthday, so I was supposed to be going out for that, so I missed that. Delivering like three people's orders, customers calling the shop complaining, saying where's my pizza, chef calling from the shop saying he needs help in the shop because there's a big queue of people. And I was speeding to do someone's delivery, went through a, um, a speeding camera, got flashed, spilt the milkshake all, on, all over the car. I'm just thinking to myself, like, is this what, you know, being, having your own businesses is about? I would say I was close to a mental breakdown at least, at least twice over the last five years, easily, you know, and I can see if you can't deal with the stress, that's another thing, you need to be able to deal with stress, you know, and pe a lot of people think, yeah, I can deal with stress, but stress is called stress because it's stressful, you know, <laughs> it's not something that you can just deal with easily because otherwise it wouldn't be called stress. So... Yeah, there's a lot of learning curves, but having a good team around you, how to find a good team, yeah, it's, there's no clear cut. You know, I can't just give you a website, you say go there and you'll find a good team. It's, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult. But the way in Nando's, before I got fired, I was very lazy, you know, so I used to like float into the background and just try not to be seen and just waste time. But now I can clock when people are doing that. So people that work for me, I can clock that because I used to be that person. So. I don't, I don't like lazy people, but same way I used to be, same way I used to be a lazy, a lazy person. That's an understatement. I used to be very lazy, but, but yeah, you, you need a good team around you. You can't do everything yourself. When, okay, cool. So like, when you first get a location, do you feel you were bumped? Because I hear sometimes like people say the surveyors or this and that, or 
You know, you know it was, I got a very good deal. Luckily, I got a very good deal. We was next to, I was driving along one day and there was a shop next to KFC and it was like an old Chinese takeaway. It was, it was proper dirty. And there was an old Chinese lady just like walking up and down in there. So I pulled up, I went to speak to her. She didn't speak English, but kind of got the message that the shop was available. And it was very, it was very cheap. It was about, this was five years ago, it's 2016. And it was right next to KFC. It wasn't on a high street, high street, but it was on like a small parade of shops. Obviously KFC brought a lot of customers. Um, so took the risk, but the thing with the, with the shop kind of businesses where you've got a shop is it's not like a digital business where you can just one day say, oh, you know what, forget it, I'll do something else and close the door. You're in a contract. It was yeah, a 15 yeah. year contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So whether you like it or not, unless you- No breakup clause. Yeah, you, yeah, no breakup clause. And you spent money in the shop anyway. You know, we, I remember we had to block off the whole road to get the pizza oven in on a crane. So it's not a case of, uh, you know what, I'll do something else. Because I felt like back in the day when I was younger, I used to have a lot of ideas and it wasn't that I would give up on them. It was that I had a better idea. So a car wash, then a clothing company. And it, it wasn't that I was just giving up after a few months. It was that I had a better idea. I had all these ideas running around in my head. Um, but with the shop, with the, with the, um, the pizza thing, it was a case of you, you can't just walk out. You know, you're stuck in there because if not, they'll, they'll send bailiffs around your, around your yard. So it was a case of I have to make it work. Yeah, do you know, and I learned that when I used to work at Habitat, um, there was a similar issue. Like they had like obviously franchises, and bro, some of their contracts were like thirty year, mm. like leases, and, and you can't break out of them. You so it's like, yeah. and I was thinking like, wait, so it's so binding, bro. Mm -hmm. So even if that shop isn't doing well, you can't close down to an extent. But Looking back at it, I suppose it was it was a good thing, because you know it made it made me stick at it. Whereas I kind of moved on to other things before, so it kind of made me stick at it. So yeah, we've gone from one shop um, in 2016 to 96 shops today. Another 54 deposits taken for different towns around the country. Um, two shops opening internationally in the next few weeks, one in Amsterdam, um, one in Northern Ireland. We've gone from you know one shop with five people to 500 employees. 100 shops, about 35 million a year um, combined over all the stores. And the mad thing is, it's all happened in five years. You know, if I'd been on it for them five years that when I left school at 16, you know, I think that's one regret is to not start immediately. But in the back of my mind, because I used to make money at school selling sweets and, and all the rest of it, I always thought that I'd be all right, so I wouldn't have to rush because it was going to happen anyway. So if I had started like immediately after leaving school, then we'd be 10 years in. So, you know, God knows what we, what we could have um, achieved. When you, when you do French, like, so is there any patenting that you have to do in terms of like... Yeah, we've had a few cases where people will copy, you know, other people will copy a um, couple shops even in London where they'll change like one letter, they'll change the logo slightly um, and the amount of money you can spend on like legal fees which we have spent is, is ridiculous just to stop someone from copying yeah, copying yeah, your yeah. thing um, and you don't get that money back so it's not as if you're you know you can claim it back so um, yeah you have this there's so many I can I've met people that have just not realized and no one told me in the beginning you know you need to copyright this you need to trademark this you need to do this you need to register this you need to file for this there's so many things people just think I want to sell pizza or I want to sell clothes or I want to sell burgers and then they don't realize that there's so many different types of things that are just unknown you know and until someone until you're driving down the road and you see a shop that looks exactly like yours you know then you don't even kind of plan for them kind of things to happen yeah and it's also what you gotta do what's you can do in UK what like was it like trademark then Europe Europe yeah. India we've done India we spent about oh, it's crazy it's I think we spent about £25,000 just for India and Pakistan to register the trademark. Yeah, and then there's ongoing fees as well. Um, but franchising in general, a lot of people message me and say, oh, how can I franchise this? How can I do this? But the fact is, we didn't advertise ourselves. You know, you need to, your own thing needs to be successful making money because otherwise no one's going to want to franchise. You know, so people say, oh, 
I want to franchise this, I want to franchise my business, can you help me do this? And then when you ask them how much they're making, it's a good start, but it's not at the level where other people are going to pay you to do the same thing as you if you're only making like a grand a week, because they can go and do their own thing. You know, a lot of people can just go and do their own thing. Um, but I suppose with franchising, you've got that kind of support um, and contacts there. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a mad five years. What? Okay, so as a, so I, <clears throat> I'll go from my understanding. It may not be what it really is. So you go to a franchisor mm. and they basically will give you like the blueprint of how to yeah. like run the business. So, you know, aesthetics, mm -hmm. you know, you know, keep the consistency X, Y, Z. And then from there, what else is it? Are you helping them with um, the manufacturing? Yeah, everything from design to um, the building side of things to the the digital side of things. Um, it's literally A to, A to Z distribution of the food, um, the recipes, the marketing, um, the data collection, literally everything from A to Z. Um, a lot of a lot of a lot of franchises they'll charge like a commission on the amount of money that you make um, whereas we do it kind of different and we charge like a set fee um, but I think regardless which whatever industry you're in you, there's going to be competition you know unless you're printing money or you've got a machine that creates gold there's going to be competition no matter what industry you're in whether it's clothing food I think food I thought was one of the most easiest things um, to do before I started um, my nan always used to say the two com the two businesses that you won't run out of customers is food and funerals because everyone's got to eat everyone's got to die obviously you can't be too creative with funerals so hence why I went into food um, but it's not easy it's not easy at all it's 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 very stressful it's it's very stressful um, staffing wise um, procurement of the, the goods, the food, we, we ship in like containers of um, tomatoes and flour from Italy. We ship in packaging from Turkey. We ship in, there's so many different, it's, it's not a case of just, you know, opening a shop and selling, unless, unless you're just gonna do an independent thing, unless you're not, you don't wanna grow and you just wanna make enough money, you know, for yourself, for your family, which is, which is, which is not, um, not a bad thing as well, you know, without the stress of, trying to go global, trying to go to the next level. Um, pizza's been voted one of the most popular takeaway foods for the last few years. So I think if you're gonna enter um, such a crowded market, you need to come with something different, um, something unique. What, what do you think is unique about Fireway Pizza? I think there's a few things. The first one is the price point is very affordable compared to the competition. The second thing is everything is on display in front of you so the freshness you can see what's actually happening um, compared to a lot of the competition that hide everything at the back in the kitchen um, the fire you can see everything being cooked in front of you and it's quick you know people don't want to wait around too long for food so the pizza's cooked in 180 seconds so it's it's fast it's uh, and it's different you know you can tell it apart from other pizza shops. Was that speed something that you just stumbled across or was it always part of the plan? Of you know what it is? People say, oh, how do you do it so quick? But if you go to Italy, there's pizza, there's pizza restaurants with massive ovens that will cook the pizza in like 60 seconds. So compared to there, it's not too fast. Okay, so I, again, why in theory do people not have the pizzas being shown? Why is it in the back? Is there any particular reason or is it? You know what I think? I think I think it's a risk to do something differently um, and not all shops want to show the customer in case something goes wrong. They don't want to show everything you know, on show. So that was a bit of a risk that we took, but we had to do something different, differently. And I think that's where it's helped, you know, because it's a more face-to-face -face experience. It's not just going into a shop and, and buying a pizza. It's a more kind of interactive experience and um, it's worked, it's worked well. Yeah, that's a, what's that um, shop? That um, shop where they do it's a. Uh, Don't say Domino's. No, no, no. no. It's, 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 it's not within the same marketplace. Um, they do the cooking in front of you, the Chinese cooking, or um, it's not hackers. Benny Harness. Benny Harness. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the whole thing you just With the it. fire and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, just, you just think, okay, cool. Yeah, this is lich. Like yeah, this yeah. is, I can see where I'm doing it. 
And I think also probably gives it a bit more of a homely yeah. aesthetic where you can actually see it. I think we've taken that kind of, because that's a big restaurant, obviously, that kind of, and just put it into smaller, you know, local stores. Not You don't have to go to central central London um, to to see that it's more of a smaller version in a, in a takeaway um, set up. Because most of the business is delivery. 70% of um, the business is, is deliveries. So... COVID, how did that impact you? COVID, it went up to about 90%. So literally the walk-in trade went down to next to nothing, but the delivery um, side of things went up to about 90%. So I know a lot of people, their, their business collapsed um, during COVID, but touch wood, um, our one, it didn't go up, it didn't go down. It literally just stayed the same. It stayed the same. Um, and not to our percentages, because I think, yeah, but it must be sometimes difficult when you're dealing with how techs come into the industry and it's like they're taking commission off mm. you know the the takeaways mm. it, does that impact you in a, do, do that, i'm saying does it add to your business or yeah. does it is it easier for it's you it's a double it's a double edged edged sword in it because it they bring you customers but they take a big chunk of it so the only thing you can really do is convert them customers into into your own your own customers we've got our own app our own website so people can order direct but you know what it is these tech companies they spend so much money on marketing and you know psychology side of things that it's just no matter how much you tell someone order on the app they'll still go and order on even, even if you said it was cheaper and it is cheaper but yeah they, they rather pay more i don't know i don't know what it is not everybody but um it's a habit and it so i think to get people out of that out of that habit um is 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 difficult but yeah it's cheaper to order order direct that's the bottom bottom line they're getting the same pizza and they're getting it for a better price so you'd think it would be a uh, simple okay when did you start when did you actually really realize what moment did you think no this this fire thing is it's really it's working now probably when someone called up and said um i've been into one of your shops can we have a meeting and i met him and when someone throws a hundred grand on the table, not cash, I don't want to worry, ta- worry the tax man, but um, when someone puts a hundred grand in front of you and says, I want to take your idea to India or I want to take your idea to, the first one was, the first one was, uh, the first one was France, I think, or Canada. So someone says, there's the money, don't let anyone else open. I can be the only person. And you know, where I thought when I was younger of business being you buy things, you sell things for more. And but when someone's giving you that amount of money, but you're not actually physically giving them anything, you're just signing a piece of paper um, to say that they can use your brand. They're the only people that can use your brand in a different country. That's when I thought, you know, we got something here. Either that or he's crazy, but <laughs> but we got something here. And then as soon as I mention that to someone else they told their cousin and someone else calls and says i want to open i want to take this country and in a space of about i think it was about five months eight countries were gone we raised you know a considerable amount of money for the distribution side of things without giving away any part of the business but giving people the rights and and even now looking back at it i think it was probably too cheap even though at the time I was in shock. <laughs> but now I'm thinking, now I'm in shock because it's too cheap. Then I was in shock because it was, I thought, yeah, I thought it, was a, it was a lot. But yeah, I think I've, I, I've loved business from, from a young age, from selling sweets in school. But I didn't realise the power of branding in businesses. You know, I always thought of it as a simple, you buy things, you sell things, clothing, you make clothes, you sell clothes. But to actually deep it in the in the brand sense of things, which is why, you know, you can go into a shop on the high street and buy a t-shirt for ten pounds, or you can go and buy a t-shirt for five hundred pounds, you know? And then when I've done that, I, even I've done it and then I've just thought to myself, like I felt like I've been bumped. Everyone likes to wear like designer clothes, but at the same time, you can try and justify it to yourself and say, yeah, but it's from Italy and it's better material. But guaranteed if you closed your eyes and felt both of them you wouldn't be able to tell. Um, but I think everyone's got their own kind of goals, targets. You know, some people like jewellery, some people like 
cars, you know, I've always wanted a Rolls Royce and I bought one a few weeks ago. But I think once you get something that you've wanted for so long, it's not always, sometimes it's better like the chase yeah. than actually get into, I don't think that you should set your goals as being material things, which is ironic because when I started a business, I started it because I wanted nice things. Um, but I, I think if you set your goal as a Ferrari or a Rolls Royce, once you get it, you'll just want a different type of car. And the same with clothes, you can you can just continue, because they bring out new clothes all the time, you'll just continuously be stuck in that circle. Money, it, it's never ending. So, you know, you, I used to say, when I started a business, I wanted to, I wanted to take home in my pocket thousand pound a week. You know, if I take thousand pound a week home, I'm good. And then when you realize how much things cost as you get older, so a thousand pound ain't gonna ain't gonna cut it. So then I said, all right, I want to make ten thousand pound a week, you know, and then I'll be good. Definitely, I'll be good. You can't make. I don't. I'm not gonna spend more than ten thousand pound a week, you know. And then you get and you just it's just never ending. So I think you should focus more about enjoying the journey than the destination because otherwise, you know, the destination will just never. It'll be a never ending destination. What I picked up on is that whole. That, that value proposition because mate like anyone especially from your background saying like you know no education outside of secondary school selling mm. sweets to someone saying here's a hundred grand just let just let me be the only person who could do this yeah. here like when did you think obviously the business has scaled up but when did you think my, my value proposition has changed now because a hundred grand then to a hundred grand now the honest answer is probably you, you realize when it's too late and that's why you don't rush into things you know um, we've had offers of investment in the that's another thing like when you get to a certain level of business the next headache is investment how much should you give away how much should you you charge and um, we had a couple offers and one of them was nearly 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 at the final stage and he offered us a couple million um, for a small percentage and everyone's telling me the people I'm like in my team saying no don't do it it's gonna be worth a lot more in the future but when someone's offering you you know a couple million and you're thinking wow you know and I'm I'm optimistic but at the same time you need to be realistic and know you know things could go wrong <laughs> so I was I was I wasn't listening to no one I, I went you know full ahead and at the last minute the guy pulled out so you know I'm not a religious person but maybe when they say things happen for a reason and now if he, if that same guy he loved nice guy by the way no no problem with the guy if he had come if he comes back to me and said actually I changed my mind uh, I want to do it I, I would say no you know, I would, I would say no. So I think sometimes things happen and you think, uh, you know, that's, that's peak. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mess up everything. But then time, as time goes on, you'll think, um, I'm glad that never happened. Because, you know, someone having 20% of your business for the rest of the life of, of the business is, is a lot of money. You know, if you, if you kind of deep how much you can make. And they're only giving you a couple million, and that's not a couple million every year. That's a couple million, full stop. Bro, I was gonna say. So, when it doesn't go through, like, how does your mood not just go? Because it, 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 it dropped. It dropped dramatically. Dropped. <laughs> it dropped. It dropped, man. Uh, it dropped. But there's nothing you can do about it. You know, you either sit there and sulk, or you just kind of say, you know, it was his loss, and uh, and you continue, even if you think in your head. It was your loss. You just you you just have to continue. You can't you can't give up, you know. Um, and I think dealing with that kind of thing and dealing you have to be able to deal with stress. Because I think one that's one of the main things when people say I want to have a business, I want to be I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to do this. The two things is I would say three things. The the three things you need is a good product. You need to give that product to people with a good service, and you need a good team them three things but you also need to be able to deal with deal with stress because it's gonna come with it as well. it's, it's gonna come and it's difficult some people don't know how to deal with it yeah. uh, and again hearing this the journey it's like there seems like there's so many places where things can kind of like go mm. wrong like especially with franchise and just you, you're doing something internationally mm. so like so many things from you know people doing the wrong thing to people copying you like outside, to you not being able to get the products to the people, to the price of the products going up. Now we've got the issue with all the, um, the lorry drivers and the delivery drivers. So luckily we had like backup of stock, but um, I would say it's just a continuous thing. You just have to continuously be on it and ready to 
you know, bat off any any obstacles because nothing's going to be, you know, plain sailing. Anything worth doing, I would say, is worth doing properly. But anything worth doing is not going to be easy. Otherwise, everybody would do it. Do you feel like your background, like from where you come from, has helped you deal with different characters in business? Yeah, I think if you come from money, then you're not really bothered either way because you know that you've always got like a plan B. But when you don't have no plan B and you don't have any education, you're not gifted with any sort of like sporting talent, um, it kind of, I think it subconsciously pushes you to make it work. But obviously it doesn't work for everyone. So it, sometimes you can't make it work, but it will subconsciously push you to try your best should I say it, making it, making it work. Um, but then that goes hand in hand with knowing when to give up. Because, you know, if I had stuck in that dead coffee shop in Tooting and I would still be there today, then, you know, I, I very much doubt that I would have done this, you know, because I, I find it difficult to, to focus on multiple different businesses. I know some people, they've got like four or five different businesses. No, I just ask them how they do it because this... Is, an, is enough is enough for me you know you from seven o'clock when I wake up and when I started a business I started it to make money and so that I could wake up whenever I want now I don't even sleep and when I do get to sleep I can't sleep because there's like a million things on your mind you know I've got to go to see this solicitor about this and then this guy is causing issues and then I need to worry about it. there's so many it just never stops which is why you need a um, a good team around you otherwise you'll 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 lose the plot what, what do you see is Next, or where where is Fireway Pizza? Where is it going? I always wanted thirty shops by the age of thirty, but on my thirtieth birthday we only had twenty nine, so I missed it. So I missed it by you always got to set yourself targets that are just out of reach, you know. So I missed it by one, but then a year later, by the age of thirty one, we had fifty shops, and then in the last year we opened fifty shops, so one one shop a week. Mm. And we've got Amsterdam, Northern Ireland, and obviously there's eight countries that we've signed deals with. So shops have to happen for them people to, you know, recoup their investment. So there will be at least one shop in each in each of each of them countries. So I suppose the simple answer is, yeah, international. International. And then also, bro, what's okay? What's like? What is the process now? Like, in, like, it's gonna sound ignorant to an extent. Like doing a deal, like. You said before, like sometimes you were a bit fast to go into things. Mm. So where are you now with your whole deal negotiations? Yeah, you need. Um, there's not just me. Then now there's you know a couple other people um, involved at, at the top. Um, so the, it, it's not it's not a simple yes or no. It would be a it would be a, it would be a you know a detailed kind of investigation into into what can work and and what can't work. Um, but to be honest, we're so busy, I don't think we can do much more than we're doing, you know. Now we've had other offers for investment, but really you need to think, money's good, but what are you gonna do with that money? If you can't, we can't open more than one shop a week, you know. Um, a couple of weeks ago we opened two shops a week because um, we had to kind of fit two shops in and you can only do so much. And I think if you, if you start to do, try to do more than you're capable of, that's when things, may start to, to go wrong and then things will get even more stressful. It's crazy that actually expansion can actually, you have to regulate the level of expansion of where to get too big mm. for what it's intended to do. Yeah, that's a, I suppose that's a good problem to have. It's better than, you know, no one wanting to open and then you're, then you're, then you're stuck. So I was, I still am quite modest where I thought people would ask me to go and give help or give talks and that and I thought we've only got 50 shops or we've only got 60 shops you know there's a lot of other companies out there that got 60 shops so I didn't feel that I was in a position to go and in give interviews or give any sort of talks because I thought that what I it's not amazing it's good but it's not amazing you know and a lot of people that say oh you're doing amazing you're doing really good then normally people around you like friends and family they're going to say that anyway so now we've got 100 shops now I'm kind of all right now we've got something to talk about <laughs> bro it's crazy when you're saying like because I think it, when you're insular when you're inside it you can't always see how it's you. Mm. It's, it's, it's difficult but bro when you're just saying like 50, 60 shots bro that is that is incredible it is incredible but that shows the level of scaling up like mm. so even when you said about the Rolls Royce 
remember G Fresh had the same thing to me. He's like, he always wanted a Range Rover, and like a week after he got it, he said he thought it was a piece of shit. <laughs> it's just like, it's like, I wanted it, and then I got it. It's like, bro, it's just, it's, it's a headache. Do you get me? But it's like, when you attain things, you, yeah. you re-collaborate, you want to move to the next level. So I'm just thinking like, bro, like, still as a young man, like, all of this, like, are you gonna are you gonna go to other businesses or is it, are you just gonna? I know you said fireworks take up a lot of your time. It's taken up a lot. I got a, I've got a few other ideas, but I don't think that there's enough time in a day to to be able to focus on more than more than one one thing, especially when it's growing this fast. And plus, you need to take some time off, you know, to 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 re recover. Um, do you get to do that? Do you ever switch up? It's difficult, but I suppose the only time would be kind of a a short holiday um, because the phone doesn't stop literally 50, 60, 70 for telephone calls a day from different people and people tell me in the team they say oh you need to get a secretary because you know all these people calling you you know it's, it's, you, you can't it's not put, and it's going to get more busy because we're going to have you know 150 we're aiming for 50 stores next year you know so one store a week um, which will take us up to 150 stores and plus obviously the international ones. So there's only so much you can do. So I think it's important to take a, to take a day off and to share some of the responsibility um, with the team. You know, there's no point being the richest man in the, in the cemetery. It's better you, you share the workload and share the, um, the reward with the people around you. And luckily, we've got a good, good team. I feel that business is... Um I feel that uh, I say this to my friends like you're gonna feel things when you get to a certain level. Like when you're an executive, mm -hmm. you have a different. Your friends don't understand about HMRC. They don't understand about council. Mm -hmm. they don't, there's a lot of things they don't understand. But like, yeah, mate, it's 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 great. It's great. And you're like, fam, we're talking different languages. Yeah. So now for you, bro, like, what? How cutthroat can business get in terms of? Because you've you're you're in that the business is generating millions now, mm -hmm. right? So. I've seen things like, I had friends who had shops in um, Thornton Heath. They were called Nubian Jack. They had okay. that one in um, Thornton Heath, Braid and the Stratum, black owned company. But then they started to tell me about how it got a bit political because the distributors were selling to them at a higher rate to try and basically get them out. And mm -hmm. like the cartels do exist somewhat in business. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying for you, like, is there, have you experienced anything? Not to say what, who it was or what it was. So you spoke anything with right, this is kind of like... Kind yeah, of mainly with distri distributors, you know, and that's why they have exclusive deals for each country with certain people and you can't kind of cut people out to go direct because they've got the, you know, and then they use that to their advantage and then they'll increase the price because they know that you can't get the same thing. So that kind of thing, I, I suppose it all comes down to money and everybody, you know, wants to make money and that's why it kind of tempts people to not do business the, the right way and uh, try and take shortcuts. Um, so the answer is yes, and it's, you, I don't think you can really avoid it. It's just how you deal with it, you know, when it happens um, is, the, is the only kind of advice I could give. So now, I would ask you that, because again, Ingrid, are you happy with what you've achieved or do you, do you feel still more? No, now I would say, now I would say I'm happy and um, in the, it's still stressful, don't get me wrong, I don't think it will ever not be stressful. Um, but I think you have to remind yourself why you're stressed. Um, you have to remind yourself why you're, why you're stressed, like them times of about rushing around doing deliveries, you know, spilling milkshakes. Um, that stress that whenever I get like mad stress, like to the, to the couple points, of like, you know, like a, I remember once I was driving back from Manchester and I was just so tired, like physically tired and mentally tired. And it was only like five o'clock in the, in, the, um, in the afternoon. And I just thought, you know, if I don't stop, I'm gonna crash. And I saw a hotel on the, on the side of the road. I just pulled up, I got a room and I just dropped and just fell asleep, you know? And that was five o'clock in the, in, the, in the afternoon. People don't see that. People see you driving around in a Rolls Royce. They see all these shops opening. They don't see, because obviously you don't show them, so you can't blame them for not seeing, but they don't, you know, sometimes realize. Um, but at the same time, when I get to a point of, you know, being mad stressed, I kind of just remind, your, remind myself that, you know, you wanted this, you chose this, you know, this wasn't forced upon you. There's, there's people out there, I had a very good friend um, 
who you know couldn't deal with the stresses of life um, and when we didn't hear from him for a couple of days me and my mate went round there climbed through the window and he was hanging so he killed himself he couldn't deal with the stresses you know he their stresses that he didn't choose to have so i kind of remind myself look who are you to you know complain or be stressed when you wanted this you know you chose you wanted to have a business you wanted to go international you wanted to have all these shops you wanted to have nice things you know you chose this so you can't really you can stop whenever you want you know there's people out there that are stressed regardless you know from all different aspects of life that they can't just turn off or or, or stop you know so yeah the, the parts that people don't really see it if you knew that from the beginning would you still want to go ahead with the business that's a good question um if I knew where we would be today, then the answer is yes. But obviously in hindsight, you don't know that it's going to succeed. You know, looking back, if I knew that we were going to get to 100 stores, we we're going to be bringing in 35 million pounds a year, you know, through the whole company as a whole, um, then obviously yes. But at that time, you don't know that that's going to be the case because there's always going to be competition. New companies are starting all the time. So... <clears throat> You, you always need to be on it because if not, someone will, you know, come along and, and knock you off. That's what business is all about, I suppose. And just like a few more questions on that. The competition element, like how much, as much as you're focused on what you're doing, how, how aware are you that like... I think... You... I try not to look at the competition, but you should know, you know, in the corner of your eye that they're there. So when people say, oh, this, this company's doing that, this company's doing that, you're interested from a, a business perspective because you need to know what the competition are doing but you don't focus all your attention or anger or you know energy onto what someone else is doing you know if someone else is doing good then then you just got to be happy for them but you need to focus on your own on your own thing because it's about making your it's not about putting someone else down or knocking someone else off it's about excelling your your own your thing, you know, what you're focused on, your business, it's about making that do the best that it's, it can, not do better than other people, you know, if you focus on it doing the best that it can, then, you know, whether other people do well or not is, is, is their business. And yeah, when you talk about, like, people, like, the whole, like, infringement of, like, IP, like, have you just seen somewhere just like, yo, you just, you just blatantly just, it's like, yeah. blatant copy and paste? Yeah, yeah, we had one in, we, we had one local to, uh, to Mitcham where I live, and um, one of my boys called me up and he said, oh, you're opening one at the end of my road. And I said, where's that? He said, in um, Mitcham Lane in Tooting. I said, no, we've already got one. It's been there for a couple of years. He's like, no, no, I see the, the sign people, they're putting up the signs. I went down there, they've copied it. They just added a word after it, you know, and I couldn't believe it. And we sent them, um, sent them a letter and they said, no, no, we're ready to fight. We're going to go to court, all the rest of it. And then got my solicitor to send a few letters, you know, and ended up paying five six thousand pounds for like five letters and then they understood and they took it down but you know, i'm not going to get back that five or six grand so you have to ask yourself in, in these um situations if it's worth spending that money you know to because to take someone to court business-wise is ridiculous the only people that really win are the, are the solicitors and and the court you know you, you can spend like hundred thousand pounds and then then if, if you win and the guy says I ain't got no money, then you can't even get it back, you know? And the, the courts, I'm, I'm sure they couldn't care less whether you win or not. So yeah, you need to, you need to, be, you need to be careful. But yeah, that, that's, in my opinion, that's just a piss take, you know, someone copying the name, not even trying to be any, put any creativity behind it, just copy and paste the name and add another word at the end. You know, that's, in my opinion, that's mad, but. Um, your friend didn't even see it. Yeah. Crazy. Then they said, oh, I got a dead pizza from your shop the other day and it's not even our shop. Yeah. Um, I think you said about branding is important. Um, and then obviously, you guys have got an Instagram page, but how, how important is like new media and just like appealing the brand to <coughs> a, a younger audience somewhat so that they're aware that um, Fireway Pizza exists? Yeah, I think times are, times are changing and it's going more towards, like you said, the tech side of things, the digital platforms, and I think any business you know you need to you need to kind of move with the times um so i think you have to kind of embrace all different avenues you can't just say are oh, we going to do just this i mean we do the marketing guy will tell you we do everything from influencers on instagram to catering for 
celebrity events to billboards um, to Facebook and Instagram uh, paid for boosts um, SMS text messaging emailing there's so many different um, that I didn't even know when I started I thought you just put leaflets in people's doors you know like old school way which works um, but at the same time I think you need to kind of attack all all um, avenues the marketing part of things it has to be really cute in terms of like you can't outbid some of probably your competitors mm -hmm. so how do you yeah it's difficult it's, it's difficult because obviously other companies that have got big pockets you know they can um, easily outbid you you know some of these companies without mentioning any names they spend hundreds of thousands of pounds every week on on marketing on all different avenues you know from underground to billboards to um, to Instagram Facebook so the simple answer is you can't outbid them so you have to kind of make your thing different which is kind of what we've done with the whole pizza industry you know it needs to be something different to stand out because if it doesn't stand out then people might as well just go to another pizza shop you know yours has to be something different and I think that's where you need to be creative more than the money side of things about how how much marketing you can do it should be about what kind of marketing you do for the money that you got for the budget that you got there's no point going and take out loans so that you can spend it on marketing you know if you don't have the money you need to kind of generate that money slowly and then build your um, marketing up gradually instead of just going crazy and doing it all at once because you might not even see a return on the on the investment in, in, just in the, in the pizza industry like are you seen as competition are you a th I don't know how it works you know what it was in one, in one, um, it's funny you ask. In one uh, award ceremony, couple, couple years ago, we went as a guest. We got invited as a guest. Uh, me and the, me and the head chef, we got invited as a guest, and we were sitting on the table with like massive table, loads of random people, couple American people, and um, I got talking to one of them during the the break, and um, I introduced myself, and he said, "Oh no, I know who you are," and I said, um, "Okay." I said, where are you from? And he, he said, um, Domino's. And uh, this is like one of the main, main guys who flew over from America for the awards. And for me to introduce myself and to him say, oh yeah, we know your eye. We're, we're, he said, we're keeping an eye on you. We've got to watch out for you. You know, that, that kind of made me feel like, rah, if, 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 if someone of that kind of position and that kind of company is saying we need to keep an eye on you, you know, that was a big uh, compliment for, for me. I think he referred to me as a bomb threat. He said, "You're a," he said, "You're a bomb threat. We need to keep, we need to keep our eye on you." So that was, yeah, that was that was very, that was um, that was motivating. Obviously, it was the competition, but it, it, it's it's motivating for a company with that much money and it's been around since, you know, 1980s, and we've been around five years and we've got hundreds of shops. What kind of lessons have you learned on your entrepreneurial journey then? I think the obvious things that people say is obviously not to give up, which is which goes without saying, because if you're going to give up, you're not going to make it very far. I think the most important thing, as I say, yeah, you need a good product, you need a good service, um, you need to wrap that up in a good brand, and you need a good team. You know, don't try and do everything yourself. You know, spread the workload and and spread the reward that you get get from that. You can try and be greedy and say I'm going to do everything myself, then I don't have to pay no one. But then you know you you after a while you'll burn out and you'll and you'll and you'll drop. I know a few people that have just had mental breakdowns from business, and it's a real thing. yeah, it's a real thing because the like like that time where I was driving around um, delivering pizzas, missed my friend's birthday because we had a, a issue with the staff, getting speeding tickets to spilling milkshakes in the car to dealing with unhappy customers, and then when you close at one o'clock, got to go to um, the cash and carry, heave loads of drinks into the car and, and, and everything else, drive back to the shop, drop it off, finally get home about half two and you know, exhaustion, but you can't sleep because you've got a hundred things on your mind and then waking up the next morning, doing it all again. And at that point, not knowing that the whole thing would even be successful in the future. So it's, I think people have to understand it's not easy. If people go into starting a business and being an entrepreneur, just for money, then it's, it's unnecessary because you can do a, a, a course for three or four years, learn a specific thing and go and make money, like a decent amount of money that, that way. You don't have to go through the stresses of opening a business and dealing with all this 
all these different kind of departments that you need to deal with from legal sides to tax to you know products to deliveries to all the rest of it you can make money you know with a, a decent job you know I think sometimes having a job like a decent one is is, is being is quite underrated um, you don't necessarily need to but if you're passionate about something and you want to kind of make a name not for yourself personally but for a company a business then then yeah I think you have to just be prepared and prepared to be stressed but kind of just remind yourself that it's it's stress that you kind of chose it's not third party stress it's you know you that you chose that and you know if you want to make it work you'll 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 make it work but it's not going to be easy I think that's the main the main thing in a nutshell just realize that it's not going to be easy and if you think it's going to be easy then it's probably not the the best idea to start and what, what do you do to relax then what's your what's your pastime so what do you do I'm a big fan of um, there's one comedy that I've been watching since I've been seven eight years old only fools and horses yeah, yeah, yeah. and that for me that was kind of my role model growing up you know, was watching that, Del Boy, <laughs> seeing them like trying to make money but always failing. Yeah. And when I watched that from a young age at my nan's house, because I spent a lot of time at my nan's house, when I used to watch that, you know, I used to just, and growing up, switch off from everything and just laugh and just forget about that. That and, and um, driving to out of town, like countryside, like Cotswold, Oxford, and just go for drives, you know, and just relax. Me personally, they're the, they're the two main things i think everyone relaxes in different ways you know um but they they would be the two for me um but yeah i think from where we've from a lot of people say oh how do you feel about where you've come till now but for me i've got so many things in my head about what's next and what the next five years is that i don't have too much time obviously every now and then um but i don't have too much time to reflect on on um what we've done in the last five years because it's kind of been a blur it's kind of been so quick that you don't really have time to if you're opening one shop every year you've got time to you know relax in between but if you're opening one shop every week and there's all these things that need to be done and you need to be able to deliver to that shop and they need to be able to uh, there's there's so many things that you don't really have too much time to to stop and think but um but yeah next five years should be interesting like, just on a material level, like, like, do you? Okay, so you got a nice car. Mm. Do you, Do you notice that people treat those who know what you do? do they are they treating you different? Those who didn't know you before and they're just thinking, "Wow, like you got this company, you got this car." Do you notice that? Mm. I suppose you do, but I, I suppose new people that you meet, you don't know how they would have treated you differently anyway. Um, but I think the people, I'm still, you know, you'll still catch me in the shop, like moving boxes, preparing things. One guy came the other day and said, oh, can I speak to like the boss? And I said, yeah, that's me. These times I'm <laughs> peeling a sticker off the window. He's like, you're the boss. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm the boss. He's like, he looked at me, he was like, nah, this guy's not the boss. He's, he's, he's peeling stickers off of, off of a window, you know? But um, for me personally, I'm still very hands-on. And a lot of people around me, they say, oh, you need to kind of step back. You shouldn't be, you know, there doing them things. But for me, I just want to get things done, so I'll, I'll get involved myself. I think as, an, as a boss of a company, as a CEO, if you're going to tell other people to do things that you wouldn't do yourself, it's going to be very difficult. So for me, you know, if I do it, then there's no reason for anyone else not to do it. You know, there's no excuse because I'll do it myself. You know, so I think um, just treat people how, how, you, how you would want to be treated. Um, and yeah, just don't forget you know, how it started and, and, and where you came from. Yeah, bro, and lastly, like, how, how did, the last question is, how do your family like see like, the successes? Because like, they've seen a lot of things that... Yeah, I think my mum, my mum in particular, because like I said, my mum was my role model growing up and getting into trouble with police and all the rest of it, you know, that, that was a kind of... I was more interested in how she was feeling than I was feeling. Um, I love my mum to bits and, and she's been there, you know, from the beginning. And to be honest, she, she couldn't care less if I came home in a Rolls Royce or in, a, in that three-wheeled van that they, that they drive in Only Fools and Horses. You know, she probably wouldn't even know the difference. So, so I think, yeah, my family are, um, I'm, are happy with what we're, what we're doing. I'm bringing my family in as well. You know, that's another thing. When you, it's not just about the money, it's about bringing opportunities, you know. Um, none of my family would, my brothers and sisters would ask me can I have money, but they'll, they'll ask me if there's an opportunity, you know, so my sister's got one shop, my, my brother, he's um, the manager in the warehouse, he's also dealing with Germany um, as the country, as the, as the master franchisee, my other younger brother, he's um, dealing with um, Netherlands, 
So they, my mum does the customer service. So there's so many, having a business, you know, we've gone from me doing everything to having 500 employees across the country. So of course you're going to have opportunities to bring, bring people in, you know, as long as they're willing to work, it's not just a handout, they're willing to work, then more than giving people money um, and nice things, you actually, for me, more importantly, is giving people the opportunity, you know. People know if they ask me just for a handout, the, the answer will be no. But if they ask me how they can get involved and, you know, make something for themselves, then, then I'm, I'm all open to suggestions. Yeah, man, that's sick to hear, man. It's inspiring because I think that's, I think everyone, not everyone, but those who get into that business, they want to look out for their family. Mm. Sounds like you just want to retire your mum, but when you can actually find a position where your mum's skill set can suit. And I think, I, I think even for me, like in, in business, bro, I think trust is a really difficult thing. Where it's like, you, you have to, you're always going to trust your family to mm. an extent. So yeah, just seeing that, man. And that's just going to help like your brothers and sisters when they have kids. And that's it. It's a, it's a, that's why when people say, would you sell the business? It would have to be like a, ridic a ridiculous figure for me to, you know, cut everything off because I don't know what I would... I can't sit still for... My friends will tell you I'm very erratic. I can't sit still for a long period of time. So unless it was a crazy figure, like, it would have to be at least 100 mil for me to actually, you know... Because we're only five years in. So for, it doesn't really make sense to, to sell anything now because, you know, we've only just started. It's only five years in. If you're talking like... 15, 20 years down the line, the potential if, if things go to plan. So yeah, I would say don't sell out too, too early.